Welcome to this video by the ACLS Certification Institute, found at www.aclscertification.com. And this video is on neonatal resuscitation. So in previous videos we had talked about pediatric. Now we're going to be talking about newly born infants, as well as the neonates. And so they make a distinction between the two, and newly born are babies that were literally just born, and uh, newborns or neonates are infants that maybe were born yesterday, but they're still in the hospital. They're still hospitalized from that initial birth, from their initial hospitalization. And they make the point to say that of all newborns, only about 10% of them are going to require some assistance at birth. And only 1% are going to require resuscitative measures. So luckily, these numbers might seem small, right? Only 1% need resuscitations, but given how many babies there are that are born, this is actually a sizable number that are going to require some degree of resuscitation. So it's important to know this, to know how to take care of these infants. So how do we identify these other 90% that don't require any resuscitation? Well, they, they have three characteristics, usually. So they'll usually be term gestation, They'll be crying or breathing, and they will have good muscle tone. So if that's the case, just dry off the baby, and then uh, go ahead and give baby to mom. Now, if that's not the case, then we might need to do resuscitation. And so here we're going to talk about it. And so this is the algorithm for neonatal resuscitation. And we're going to talk about it in detail, but you can see the first step here is if they are of term gestation, uh, breathing, good crying, or good tone, then yes, they, uh, they get to stay with mom if they answer all those questions. If not, then we move on. And the first thing that we should notice here is this here. We have this 60 seconds in which case we need to do a couple of different things. And this is called the golden minute. And in that golden minute, we need to do a whole bunch of things. The first thing we need to do are complete some initial uh, actions here, such as uh, warming the baby, clearing the airway if necessary, drying them up, and stimulating them. And then we have to assess two uh, vital characteristics, their heart rate and their respirations. Now, when you feel the heart rate, you're not going to be getting a radial pulse because these babies are tiny and you're not going to feel those. There's two places you could check. You could actually feel on the chest of the baby, feel a precordial pulse, or at the umbilicus, at the umbilical stump, and feel the pulse there and count from there. So, again, you want to feel for the, feel it on the umbilicus or on the chest to get the pulse. Now, you might be tempted to use a pulse oximeter to do this, right? Because it measures heart rate. It also gives you some idea of how well they're breathing. But you cannot put on a pulse oximeter in less than a minute. So, it's, not, it's going to take too long. So, that golden minute, just feel, the, feel it quickly on the chest or on the umbilicus. Now, that's not to say that a pulse oximeter isn't useful, because look, we eventually are going to put it on, but that's going to be once we pass the gold minute. If we think that something's wrong, if the heart rate is less than 100, or they're having some trouble breathing, like they're gasping or apneic, then we're going to start positive pressure ventilation, and then you can put on a pulse oximeter. So, obviously, things are going to be happening here pretty quickly. So, you need to have some things uh, prepared ahead of time. So, you want to predict, you want to look for patients who might have, or babies who might have problems, and it's going to usually be preterm babies, and they're, they're at risk because they have immature lungs, they have immature blood vessels in their brain that can actually start bleeding, they have very thin skin and a large surface area, so they can become hypothermic very easily, they're very prone to infection, and because they have such a small blood volume, any small amount of blood they lose from, from birth uh, could cause hypovolemia and even hypovolemic shock. So at deliveries where you are, are expecting this, the you know, preterm or you're worried, uh, you should have someone there who, who is ready and who can resuscitate these neonates. So let's talk about these initial steps first. The initial steps are warming, clearing the airway, if necessary, drying, and stimulating. So we know that these babies are definitely prone to hypothermia. And so a lot of times you're going to need additional warming techniques. And things you could do are like pre-warming the room. There are heated mattresses you could use. And they even say that you could wrap the baby in plastic wrapping. Food grade or medical grade heat resistant plastic. So you're going to put the baby in plastic. Obviously don't put their head in there. And you got to measure their temperature closely. And so they have those 
uh, temperature sensors that you could put on the baby's chest or head that are usually part of the uh, bed that you use, the resuscitative uh, bed that you use for the patient. But additionally, the other, in order to keeping them warm is one thing, but you also don't want to let them get too hot because uh, fever, hyperthermia can cause problems. So you got to get that temperature just right, not too hot, hot and not too cold. So now let's talk next about clearing the airway. It used to be that as soon as a baby was born, before their head was, you know, before their entire body came out, their head just came out, we would take our bulb suction and start suctioning out the baby's airway, nose and throat immediately. But what we found out actually is that this can cause bradycardia in babies. It can also cause problems with their lungs. So we're not going to do this uh, on all babies anymore. We're only going to do it for babies who have obvious obstruction to their breathing, something that is preventing them from breathing. Another thing that we would do is that in babies who had a uh, meconium, meaning their first poop, uh, you could see it, they were meconium stained, they would be intubated upon birth and suctioned, and then oftentimes repeatedly intubated and suctioned, repeatedly intubated and suctioned, intubated and suctioned. And this has been shown not to be helpful in babies who are vigorous at birth. So, in babies who are moving around well and they look good, you don't have to do this unless they have their bradycardic or you're going to be intubating them for some other reason, or they're non-vigorous. So you can, there's not any evidence to say we shouldn't do it in the non-vigorous babies, but in the vigorous ones we should not be doing the repeated intubations and suctioning. So in babies who are meconium stained, but they are vigorous, we are not going to intubate and suction. Now, drying and stimulate is usually you take one of those uh, hospital baby swaddling blankets and you dry the baby and at the same time you're drying them, you know, you're moving all around them and that stimulates them and hopefully that would be enough to get them awake enough to start breathing more properly and heart doing well, etc. So those are our initial steps that we're going to do in the resuscitation and this is still within the first minute and at this point uh, we're going to check our baby's heart rate and see if it's you know, what it is and remember we're going to check that on the chest or on the umbilicus and we're going to watch the baby's respirations. Are they gasping or apneic? And if they're not, if they're doing fine, they're not having labored breathing or persistent cyanosis, you know what, go ahead and give the baby back to mom and do your routine care. But if they are, if their heart rate is less than 100 and they're gasping or apneic, you may need to consider now giving them some breathing, some positive pressure ventilation and the pulse oximeter. Now, this is where we take a little turn to, to discuss uh, pulse oximetry in these newly born kids. Now we know that hypoxia is dangerous but just the same hyperoxia, excessive oxygenation can be harmful to the newborn infant and so we've got to get just the right amount of oxygen and there's they give us a little table here to uh, show us and this is it. So you can see the first minute after birth expect a pulse ox between 60 and 65 percent. That's really low. That would normally freak us out but that's what you got to go for. And so don't try to put them on so much oxygen that they get higher than that. Two minutes, we get 65 to 70. Five minutes, 80 to 85 percent. And at 10 minutes, we're at 85 to 95 percent. So that said, if you were to put them on 100 percent oxygen through your positive pressure ventilation, you are going to get numbers that are way, way, way higher than these. And so we're not going to use 100 percent oxygen. You're going to use room air because we don't want to get that damage from the hyperoxia. So what about this positive pressure ventilation? Well there are uh, numerous devices you could use to deliver this. Uh, the bag valve mask is one but there are others that have uh, valves in it that prevent you from delivering too much volume, too much pressure because lungs, baby lungs, especially preterm lungs, are very easily damaged by large volumes of uh, inflations. And the rate you want to go is 40 to 60 breaths per minute. So small volumes and 40 to 60 breaths per minute. And the goal here is to get the heart rate to get above 100. Remember that's why we started it because our, usually our heart rate was below 100. And that's one of our best indicators of good adequate initial ventilation is the heart rate. Remember that babies uh, have heart cardiac problems, cardiopulmonary problems, Cardiac problems come from pulmonary problems. Most of their arrests are respiratory. 
So at this point, it's unclear whether you need to use one of those CO2 detectors to see if you're getting it in good ventilations, but the heart rate is a good thing to look at. Aim for above 100. So what do you do now? After you've done that, you've, you've begin some positive pressure ventilation using either a self-inflating bag or one of those T-piece mechanical uh, devices that help give good ventilations that prevent you from overventilating, or if you don't have those, you use the bag valve mask. Uh, but if you do that and the heart rate is, st is still less than 100, well, then maybe you're not giving good ventilation, so you need to try to correct your ventilations. Because remember, we're going to use heart rate to, to uh, determine the adequacy of our ventilations, and the heart rate is still less than 100. Maybe we're not doing a good job. And if you're worried about the ventilations, the way to correct it is to think of this mnemonic, Mr. SOPA. So let's talk about what Mr. SOPA means. The first M stands for mask readjustment, so maybe the mask is not tightly applied to the face. The next R stands for repositioning the head. Maybe you need to get them in a better sniffing position. And you could look at the PALS video for what that means, but that means tilting the head back so it, uh, the nose is in the air like you're trying to smell a flower. Then the next one, S, is to suction the nares and the, oral, and the pharynx. You want to get any stuff that might be blocking their uh, nose and mouth. Uh, uh, get that cleared up. O is to open the mouth. Maybe you need to get that air in through the mouth. Remember, babies typically breathe through their nose, but they uh, maybe you can you put something in there to keep their mouth open. P is to increase the pressure, and you can do that up to a maximum of 40 centimeters of water. And then the final A is an alternate airway. Maybe it's time to intubate this patient. So that's Mr. Sopa, mask readjustment, reposition the head, suction the nares, open the mouth, pressure increase, and alternate airway. And we do these things to try to improve our ventilations, right? Because we said the heart rate was less than 100. Perhaps it's because the positive pressure ventilation we were giving before was not good enough, so we try and fix it. All right? Now, if we do that, and the heart rate is below 60, then we're going to go to other problems. If, if it's above, if it's, we're going to go check other things. But if it's between 60 and 100, well, we need to continue our corrective steps. And we will look at those next steps that we go to in the next video. All right, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.